sort of not uh, putting out enough alarm about the extreme cases. And now the IPCC is discussing it's that the that consistently our present is already worse than the worst model prediction. That it's the Arctic sea ice, the melting weight in Greenland, the trot in the places where the models are saying the trot and heat stress is becoming more. We're always at the extreme in the band between two and three sigma of what we thought is the worst possible, according to the range of model predictions. So therefore, it's very hard to use the current models and say this is how the future will look like because their mean is very far off from what we're seeing right now. So that is my take on the thing. Yes, I, I agree that I mean, it's hard to predict what will happen. I mean, we can predict that we'll have bad consequences if we don't stop the rate of uh, climate change. But what exactly will happen, devastating it will be, it's still up in the air. But uh, we can all agree that the the more we reduce the rate of climate change, the better it is for us. So I think in the scientific community, there's a little argument about that. Mr. So. Tahir. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, since uh, I come from Himalayas, uh, Kashmir, <laughs> so uh, we have a stories to tell that in our place, this climate change is already showing its effect because what we are is like a micro habitat thing. And this climate change is basically affecting us more than the larger landscape scenario thing. The common, like the smaller things, flash floods or the exotics that are coming in. I mean, the human man animal conflict, I'll speak because I'm a wildlife biologist. So the human wildlife conflict that's coming in, I'll attribute it to the climate change. Um, so that is something we have in question for you. So like, we'll sit for it. Like, <laughs> right. <you> know, <laughs> right. In a good yep. way. Yeah. So just a small thing. And okay, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but uh, Dr. Dhanya is here. And okay, we can officially start. Uh, yeah. Welcome, ma'am. I hope everything's okay. It took you a while to join, but yeah, let's say hello. Hello, Hi. everyone. <laughs> good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm sorry for you. Uh, keeping you waited, I was, oh, it's okay, talking, it's okay. uh, but there is internet issue that is not so common there, so I had to drive back to home. So we'll see here at home. I have internet issues, so we'll see how far it can go. No issues, yeah. So a very good good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope you're doing great. Thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday afternoon as we sit to discuss one of the most raging issues in our country. Uh, also in the century, climate change. And it's more focused to what our governing bodies have in their plans to undo these catastrophic changes in the environment. On behalf of the All Eyes Conservation Committee, I welcome all of you to this panel discussion on the role of government in avoiding climatic catastrophes. I am Simran from Isa Barampur on behalf of my team. And I will be your host and moderator for today's session. I take this opportunity to introduce our panelists to everyone. Um, welcome, Dr. Dhanya. She uh, completed her master's in physics and a PhD in physics. Furthermore, she's a postdoc fellow in the Max Planck University, the Institute of Environmental Physics, and a research scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, funded by the NASA. Currently an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Isa Bhopal. She's the head of the Max Planck Partner Group since 2017. Her research group, the Atmospheric Greenhouse Gas Modeling and Applications Group, is established to facilitate research involving development of atmospheric numerical models and applying different observational and atmospheric modeling approaches to improve the understanding of climate change. Dr. Ullasa, he is an associate professor in the School of Biology at Isaac Trivandrum. 
after being deeply inspired by the forest of Western Ghats during his bachelor degree in forestry, he moved to uh, Stockholm University, where he worked on phylogenetics and biogeography of evolutionary biology, especially by addressing the questions in prey-predator interactions, insect-plant coevolution, phenotypic plasticity, and life history traits. Next, we have Dr. Birbal Sinha. She's an associate professor at Isaac Mohali, and her work focuses on mechanistic understanding of particulate matter pollution and the impact of particulate matter on rainfall and climate change. She's actively involved in investigating atmospheric particles and understanding its impact on the radioactive properties of aerosol particles. And we have Mr. Tahir. He's a trained mountaineer, skier, adventurer, and who joined WTI in 2017. He has two master's degrees and has been actively involved in wildlife conservation right from his high school. With a master's in zoology from Nagpur University, he specializes in, in man, forest entomology, man-animal conflict mitigation, black bear rescue and rehabilitation and conservation awareness with almost eight years of experience of work in Kashmir and Himalayas. He currently works for the Markhor Conservation Project and has been an award-winning short uh, documentary on Markhor's part. Okay, so coming to why we chose today's issue is uh, India completed, uh, committed to the Paris Agreement in 2015. However, there is no clear data about this implementation in the country. Social transformation and public participation do play a huge role in the implementation of this treaty, which makes this discussion really relevant to the public. The Indian government had set remarkable goals in, uh, in the agreement, which if implemented would greatly reduce the carbon footprint of our nation. And six years from then, Today, we try to discuss where we as a country stand in its commitments and goals set in the agreement. Also, uh, I would like to introduce us. We are the All Isaac Conservation Committee. We are an initiative to spread awareness about the impending hazards to our environment, climate and ecosystems, and analyze and mitigate the situation in its scientific light. We have members from every ISA's Environment Club joining hands to make an effort towards promoting conservation and creating awareness amongst our peers. Through this panel discussion, we hope to bring awareness to the various environmental and global climatic catastrophes witnessed by our generation and find ideas to contribute our part in conserving our heritage. So welcome all and thank you for joining. And we can now begin our discussion. So, yeah, Dr. Dhanya, you did join a little late and we started on, you know, how the past year has shown us a lot that we, like I as a child didn't imagine that I'll be seeing floods in Germany or like huge landslides in Turkey in its wildfires or the heat waves in Canada. So what do you think, um, you know, what are your views about it? And what do you think future looks like for us? Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for the elaborative introduction. And, um, and also, um, uh, thank you for having me here. And um, as I mentioned before, it is a very timely discussion. You uh, put it up on this time as well, because we are doing for the COP26 and in, in, in months. So it is a very timely discussion, I thought. So it was, and congratulations on uh, selecting this kind of topic. Um, so I know that it is uh, more or less very much uh, student initiative uh, because I hadn't had any much role that, that, uh, rather than being called for as a panelist. So coming back to your question, uh, yes. Um, so first of all, I would, uh, I would like to iterate because everybody knows uh, so the climate change, the topic itself is a very complex topic and to address some of this aspect, uh, we may need, uh, because it has multi-phase uh, challenges, so we may need a multi-institutional and multinational, everything is coming in the multi-way, 
so we need to address in that way so uh, when it, so we have to think from the holistic view at the moment uh, uh, at the uh, same time we also have to have some action plans so uh, to the to answer to the question yes we are on track but we are very much on the slow motion so we have to accelerate very much and during this pandemic itself we have seen how sizable actions we need to mitigate even uh, the, uh, the the virus effect so now we can imagine what kind of sizable uh, magnitude action should be required to mitigate some of the adverse effect of the climate change and so on so uh, coming to the the government thing yes uh, when it comes into the policies or uh, like you know intervene these kind of actions uh, the government has a huge role on it i think uh, we uh, we know we, there are uh, in uh, like a list of tasks to be done by the government but uh, i would like to to make one or two priority things so the first thing which i uh, comes into my mind is uh, about the information or the knowledge part because knowledge part itself is to some extent is missing because uh, we know the climate change is happening we know the science uh, but at, when it comes into the implementing the science we have many many unknowns so this is more about the knowledge gain so the knowledge will not come just like that so we need to invest uh, uh, some 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 of the research aspect um, to uh, for the research efforts so for that uh, we need coordinated actions with some financial uh, backup because otherwise it may not be possible and the second uh, priority is more about like uh, giving the public awareness uh, like because those are the public goods those awareness are the public goods so we have to give the right information because uncertainty is a kind of salient feature of this climate change so we have to provide the right information to the right body so these are i think these are the pri priority sectors which are uh, heavily lacking um so mm, yeah <laughs> so i think that is more or less uh, what i would like to begin with and i'm um, i would so like much. to hear from others <laughs> So they have already spoken and jumping to our questions. Um, I'll be reading out the questions and you can just go ahead and answer whoever feels like you know you want to go first, and we'll take views of all of you. Uh, okay. So the first question from us is that the government claims that the targets of Paris Agreement will be achieved well before 2030, uh, but various scientific agencies say that only 50% of the promised goals can be achieved considering the development that we have. Happen till now. Um, what can be done to achieve the goals timely, and how can citizens contribute to this? Uh, okay, Dr. Dhanya had already answered hers. So, the others. So, I think there's uh, two accounts to what the government promised. One was that they'll in uh, that they'll reduce the carbon intensity of the economy. And the other promise was a certain renewable share. Um, so the carbon intensity of the economy is the one where a lot of people feel it may be tricky, particularly with the focus on make in India. So it's very easy to have a good carbon intensity with not too much energy generation if you don't aspire to be a manufacturing superpower. If your exports are mainly IT, uh, then it's very easy to be energy efficient. Uh, but if you're trying to now straight and compete with China for making the cheapest plastic in the world, then that's gonna come with a huge environmental footprint. Um, so that Make in India initiative is one place where the government policy is right now not aligned with its Paris Agreement. Um, the other thing is the subsidies on coal. The Indian coal sector is heavily distressed. If the government wasn't pimping it, either through the banks or directly, um, half the coal plants in the country would already be bust and shut down. So uh, we actually have a huge overcapacity. The average load factor of Indian coal is 
50%, one could easily shut down the dirtiest 20 plants with no change in power supply. But that's not happening because it's politically not desirable. So if, if you ask me what the Indian government can do directly, then these are the biggest things where policy is not aligned with health schools. But there is a global issue, and that is whatever the Indian government does, does very little. Because globally, the top 1%, that's like 70 million, the richest people, they emit two times more than the entire 3.5 billion at the bottom. And that includes like your and mine, electricity and everything. So um, that is actually an equity issue. And that's not something on which the Indian government can act alone because that the global elite is not paying any taxes and can afford to burn thousands of tons for three, million, uh, for three minutes of zero gravity, like for a handful of people, that is an equity issue. And that will take a global consensus to fix because these people, they just move to the next tax haven if one country tries to fix it. So that's my view on that. So, would, so Beba, would you think having a tax, a climate tax, identifying uh, the elite and having a tax, special tax, do you think that can be done by the government? It Indian cannot government? be done by one nation because these international corporations, they essentially move to the next tax haven if they get taxed in one place. So there are movements to try and enforce a sort of global minimum tax on corporate profit, but right now they're going nowhere, which is unfortunate. So the only thing that the Indian government can say legislate is uh, that what, what China is doing now, that certain business models are not allowed to uh, generate the amount of profit that they are generating uh, or that delivery partners have to be treated more fairly if they are delivering in India. That kind of thing may be possible, but like the tax on something like Amazon, that would have to be global because they can easily move their profits offshore and then they're making loss in India officially. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mr. Tahir? Um, yeah, I might add something. Um, uh, also, when we go at like individual legislation systems that we have in India, like we have Wildlife Protection Act, like we have a Forest Protection Act, we have Air Protection Act or soil or all those acts, they are decades old little things, like they're 20, 30 years, 40 years back. When uh, climate change was no concept, to some extent, it was not a concept. And now when we even change the name of the ministry to Ministry of Climate Change itself, so here we need to do something else, like, you know, roping all those laws as per the need, because we have already agreed to do something which cannot be done alone by the government policies until we have legislations strongly backing them. We have scientific agencies proving them every time. Yes, this is done and this needs to be accelerated. This needs to be decelerated. That's very much which the government can do right now before we take it to the local people, like, you know, when it comes to the uh, actioning of the things, like where the masses are involved. Yeah, obviously, and again, that we need to target masses as well, as doctors rightly said. So I think uh, not changing the legislation, but yes, getting the climate change concept into the legislation, like the Wildlife Protection Act or the Forest Protection Act or the Water Act, it's necessary right now. That's my point. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next one is, uh, have there been any climatic uh, events globally or in India in particular? Uh, that shows that climate change is already here and is our present, not our future. Mm -hmm. I think it's more or less answered, mm -hmm. but still, if you want to go for it. I think it is. It's so yeah. evident. I mean, it's evident that it's here. And uh, so we can see outside. And I think this is the first time in the year, uh, <coughs> like everywhere in, on the globe, at the same time, we have catastrophe. Like it is like uh, not only in Europe or India, it is in the, everywhere. So no other way. So the frequency of the extremes uh, have shown its uh, potential 
all over the globe. I think everyone over the globe will agree on it because they have been influenced by those or impacted by that. So <laughs> I think that is so evident. Yeah, but Danya, I think one of the issues is, I mean, you just mentioned that everyone will agree. Uh, it seems to me that the climate change skeptics, at least in India, they're not so uh, yeah. large in number in terms of the population. Yeah. But big countries like the US, which are the major contributors to climate change, mm -hmm. they have a very high proportion of climate change skeptics. Yes. And the global efforts to curb climate change, you know, they're kind of derailed to yeah. a significant extent by yeah. uh, the climate change skeptics. Right? Yes. So um, I think there's uh, more that can and should be done to uh, reduce this skepticism towards uh, climate change. I mean, it's easy to say more should be done and more can be done, but uh, it's hard to implement such things, especially when even political leaders themselves, many of them don't believe in it. But I mean, we have uh, societies like uh, eco nature clubs, ecology societies, in the ISIS and so on. So perhaps there's a role for the students to play. I mean, if you can start and spread more awareness uh, among school kids and so on, it's a small start. It's not going to change climate skepticism in the US, but it's a start and it's going to make a small nick uh, and hopefully in the long run, there are more and, there's more and more awareness and the skepticism is lost. Then, If everyone actually believes climate change is a problem, then it's easier to tackle it. I mean, if you take uh, the COVID pandemic, everyone, well, not everyone, but a very large proportion of the world realize that it's a problem and vaccine will solve. So in that sense, the vaccination rates are quite high. But if you imagine a situation where there's a high vaccine skepticism, then it would have been much more difficult to achieve whatever legislation the government brought to. So in that sense, I think uh, creating awareness through governmental policy have more in the curriculum and ourselves, you know, um, be me as a teacher, you as students who are teachers to other uh, school kids, for example, if you can organize some camps or, if you can visit schools and talk about climate change and prepare some material that can be distributed and so on, I think all these will go. I won't say they'll go a long way, but they'll make a difference, I think. And in the long run, this is what we need. We need to, re we really need to get everyone on board to agree that climate change is a major issue. Uh, if it's come to education and students, I. I don't think I have read a lot about climate change being an integral part of our syllabus. Um, I think in the 12 years of my education, but yeah, that's a good point. We'll take that up. Uh, okay, so the next one is, um, uh, how much in your, in your opinion and vision can, um, you know, strictly part practice policies on emissions, uh, population control and conservation have an immediate positive effect on the environment? Um, shall I start? <laughs> okay. So um, I would say that, um, uh, like, for example, in the air pollution aspect, we have seen the last year, we have seen the effect of our reduced emissions. But when it comes into the climatic aspect, um, it is not necessarily that you, we will see uh, as an like, immediate effect. That's for example, this is uh, the, going back to your first question. So like uh, by 2030, we had some commitment or we, are, we were uh, we committed to you try something. So that is like our, that uh, commitment itself uh, will not uh, be um, there because our actions were not that uh, accelerated or not on that uh, proactively. So um, I would say that it takes a time. So it is not, that is also one of the drawbacks of the climate change to create public awareness because when it came, when it came into the pandemic situation, then people know that this is the effect. Yeah, we are going to die very soon because of the virus or we are going to affect it. 
So this kind of uh, scenario is not there in the in many times. I'm say, not saying all, but many times this is not there for the climate uh, uh, climate changes because it takes time and it shows the warnings. And then it is as I agree with Ulas. So it, uh, I also want to reiterate when I, when I say all, since I'm in the scientific institution. So for me, like um, many times I refer to scientists or the students. So that is, uh, so I want to reiterate, uh, reiterate. So maybe it's the scientific community, it is very well known that this is happening. But uh, when it comes into the large community, then it, yes, we have to work on those, those aspects as well. So, um, so I would say that the immediate effect, like uh, that is also one of the thing which uh, which also like as a kind of uh, kind of kind of obstacles for us to create awareness because people are not aware of uh, uh, these things unless we can point out okay this is the catastrophe and this is happening because of this and that but there are large number of people uh, don't have to believe so. So I think I would like to disagree with that. So I think that actually awareness is not so important in this context. Because first of all, one doesn't convince a denier by um, trying to convince them that climate change is real. Um, and that's really not the point. I mean, that's not what we need out of that person. What we really need out that, of that person is that they, uh, for example, um, change their incandescent bulb against an LED bulb or switch their gas stove to an induction stove or put a solar panel onto their roof because the electricity will cost them half a day. Uh, so it makes much more sense to engage with such people on the economic uh, to show them how much their electricity bill will go down if they change their fan to a Crushless DC motor fan that keeps only 18 watt instead of 75 watt because fans run for a lot of hours. Or to switch to an inverter AC, five star inverter AC, which consumes a lot less uh, power than a conventional AC. So um, it makes more sense to engage with skeptics on the economic of the desired behavior and drop the climate change topic altogether. Because you'll never get them over to the to acknowledge climate change is real, but a lot of people want to save money, so that's something you can get out of them even if they don't believe in climate change. And uh, the other thing is that in India, a lot of people who are taking very efficient climate action have no clue about climate change. Uh, so, for example, there are large sections in the uh, mountains who are discovering more traditional ways of growing crops, the multi-cropping, growing several crops in the same plot instead of growing a monoculture. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to manage an incredibly unpredictable weather with something that has proven to be more resilient under such conditions because some crops may boil, but some of them will still mature. So it's if you have a monoculture, you get the wrong weather event at the wrong time, you face a total loss. Whereas in multi-cropping, if you are having 20 different crops on the same half acre, some things will survive too much rainfall. Some things will survive a trot. At the end of the day, you're still having something. So these traditional farming systems are being rediscovered primarily and promoted primarily as a Resilience matter and also these are farming systems which, for example, do not use energy intensive synthetic fertilizer. They pay much more attention to biodiversity. They don't use the same amount of pesticides primarily because these inputs are costly. So these people are not trying to do something about climate change. They are merely trying to make a living the way they have the need. But these are the largest scale climate change mitigation that is happening on the ground, which is fixing carbon in the soil, which is fixing carbon in tree biomass for the shade and the wind protection. And it's hugely successful in certain parts of India. So I think we don't need to convince people about climate change, but rather where such initiatives are often uh, failing is that the people who are trying to make the shift 
they don't even have the money to buy a handful of things or they don't have the know-how how to do it. So it's more about the uh, guidance, about the outreach, about a very tiny, they're talking like 100, 200 rupees startup capital, which can be a problem for a very marginal farmer. So that is really what makes a lot of difference in the Indian context and the area matters. Uh, Mr. Tahir and Dr. Ulasa, I would like to ask you about this uh, same aspect if you see in terms of population control and conservation. Do you think like these have some impact there or like how far are we? Um, if we look at the vulnerability scale of India, uh, I think we're probably the 11th or the 12th one vulnerable country to climate change. And then if you look at the per capita emission of uh, this uh, carbon carbon emission, we are very very low in the scale. Like I think we are seventy uh, below the national this uh, global average and ninety three below US. So that makes us think that what it is basically where do we need to address the situation? You you I mean we have a lot. I mean the population we know the populations. So but we also know the point sources where where we need to basically address immediately. So you know given this thing the vulnerability and the basic point of this thing. It seems, I mean, we need to devise a slightly different policy what the other countries do. Like if you look at the US and, UK, uh, US and uh, China, the 40% is contributed by them, but they might not be thinking on our scale because of, of their development and the economy that we are to deal with. So I think, uh, you know, we at times to deal with this, pop, uh, this problem, how to have our own Indian policy thing rather than to go with what the globe goes or what those uh, developed nations go with. Owing to the fact that what uh, Dr. Bibel rightly said that uh, that farm, farming issue and so, so many other issues. Just if we look at that point source where basically the major problem arises, if we address it there, that's the key thing. I think uh, well, it's uh... It's, I mean, it's a simple equation. If you can keep the population in check, well, in check, meaning the, if you can reduce the rate of population growth, we also reduce global change. But then, uh, what do we do about it? Obviously, I, mean, I think the policy has been there to control the population growth rate. Again, it's the same set of issues that we face here. I mean, we have to have them. I mean, we probably cannot have draconian legislations like what China did, one child policy. We probably cannot have that. So we can have uh, incentives for having a smaller family and so on. Those kinds of things have been there, which have been discussed for, uh, I think, several decades, much longer than they've been discussing climate change. Uh, so the solutions are not clear, at least in terms of uh, how to reduce the rate of population growth, but the government is already doing quite a lot of things. And, uh, but if I may interject there, then India is on a population trajectory where the population will peak about five years earlier than it was projected in the most optimistic scenarios that are there in the I. So it will peak about uh, 2045 instead of 2050. It will also peak uh, slightly below 1.5 billion, most likely. So if one looks at the data that has come out of the latest National Health Survey, the 2019 one, then actually virtually all states are now below their production level in terms of the social fertility ratio. So population control is no longer the biggest challenge. It also doesn't help much because it's still that the richest 1% are producing two times more than the bottom 3.5 billion. So if you, uh, it doesn't help to control the population if you don't control the miles that a uh, private jet is flying for an individual or mm -hmm. the rockets that some billionaires are launching into space. That's really it. Which I mean, that, that is true, but then if you have a much larger population and the economy is doing well, then you have many more cars out there. 
and of course we can talk about switch to electric vehicles and so on but uh, in general don't you think there's more pollution and so on and don't you think the everyday person even though each person contributes very little don't you think with a bigger population we still have a much higher contribution so, so what i'm thinking is that the population rate corporate has already gone to zero we are now already at the zero point net india population is no longer growing now a too fast the shrinkage rate is also a problem because that at some point leads to a very high dependency ratio uh, which is something that china is battling with now so i think we don't really need to focus that much on the population control because that has really been that problem has been solved with the right to education act there is a clear correlation that a number of years a girl goes to school uh, versus number of children she gives birth to there is a clear uh, sort of anti correlation and uh, now most women have two or less children uh, so it often only one of the first one is a son because son preference is still there and that comes with its own set of problems in terms of population uh, imbalance so i think we don't need to focus that much on trying to press that accelerator because it will cause other problems is my i have um, Yeah. Yeah. I have one point uh, with respect to the economic growth and the climate change mitigation strategies because we should not uh, think that these are uh, opposite because uh, the uh, the economic growth like uh, these are very much related because if you see uh, the the poor societies or the poor uh, nations with poor infrastructure they have more impact on the future climate Uh, changes so economic growth is inevitable so it should not uh, be visualized that uh, if you want to have the uh, climate change mitigation or infrastructures then we have to slow down the economic growth because that is uh, that is really will do the opposite effect because we will be uh, the nation becomes more and more vulnerable to the future climate change which we do not know yet so i would say that uh, that economic growth is inevitable and we are uh, we need to have more actions uh, towards the sustainable development rather than saying uh, that we should cut this and we should stop this because for example if somebody tells me tomorrow don't use uh, like a car for a, for a year or something i will not be happy although i'm working on the climate science because that is more about the practical uh, solutions to my day to day activities so then the, then it is more or less what alternative i can and <clears throat> at this point of time we do not have much that kind of large scale technology so that we can replace those kind of uh, things but it is coming up uh, so we so the the nations or this is what i was trying to say from the from the government policies uh, other than the, the the agriculture segment which people has mentioned about where the local uh, uh, priorities or local uh, uh, actions are successful on those cases but there are cases where the national based policies or the global level based which is not only the nation solo is the global uh, level uh, policies makes changes because these are the things which we need uh, a combined effect only one nation or one state cannot achieve these kind of things so this is more or less this is what i meant with the policy interventions and so if when it comes into the reductions in uh, in the emissions there are immediate questions come from from how many of us are ready to change the life state and how affordable are those and where are the other tech alternative technologies whether they are feasible enough and uh, so these kind of question needs to be, uh, be th- that would be the there so once those questions dominate then no actions or nothing will be successful and um, we cannot go ahead with this kind of treaties and then when you say that if uh, like after the uh, this is the climate change your your next generation will 
uh, will get affected with this, most of the people will think about, okay, what about my generation? So these kind of questions will come and then we cannot walk or talk on those kind of lines. So I would say that this is, this is where more like a centralized uh, policies are needed together with some kind of decentralizations. So I would fully second that it's actually a misconception that the economic focus will always sort of uh, change the energy footprint to the work on all sectors. So for example, if you take cooking, um, so in terms of effective cooking energy that it is required to cook what we eat normally in India, it's about uh, 1,100 megajoule or so per person per year. Um, now, if that comes from an induction cooker, which has like uh, somewhere 80 to 90% device efficiency, I don't need that much more megajoule uh, than I'm actually delivering to the food. But suppose I do that on a chula. A chula has a device efficiency of 10%. So then I actually need to burn like 10 times that much uh, like fuel, in terms of uh, energy content in the fuel and I cause a whole lot of air pollution and black carbon emissions in the process um, to cook the same food. So there, there's clearly a point where the progress to the higher economic ladder, such as the shift towards buying more LPG cylinders or the shift towards um, an induction cooker actually uh, cuts the emissions. So in that sense, and the same is there for lighting. There are a lot of poor people in the villages who actually who keep buying like incandescent bulbs simply because that bulb costs only 10 rupees. And the power is so bad that if they buy an LED, the LED gets knocked off in four weeks. And they can't afford to buy a new LED every four weeks. So they buy a 10 rupee incandescent bulb every week because that is how long that lives on that kind of a power. Um, so these are all examples where actually moving up the economic ladder brings lower emission. Well, uh, now that you've talked about energy, someone asked that conflicts between green energy projects and the conservation of natural habitats has been an, in, uh, they have been increasing, but um, there are examples like uh, solar panel projects in the great Indian busted habitat and deforestation for installing wind turbines in several places, they raise a concern. So do we have a solution to these problems? Better for solar. So right now, most of the solar in India is always big commercial scale. That has to do primarily, uh, one thing is the cost of labor scale. So the solar panel is not that costly anymore, but if an individual buys a solar panel for the roof, then 50% of the total charge is actually the labor charge because two people still have to come to install it. So that is right. Rooftop solar is more costly than uh, the large scale solar in terms of the final electricity price. Um, so if the government as some sort of employment generation measure, for example, would subsidize that labor charge, rooftop solar would be I mean, the best place to produce energy and transmit it without losses is where it's being consumed. So there's a lot of unused area there simply because the large projects on a rooftop is something that the utilities don't want. They lose their most profitable customers. And the small scale rooftop cannot yet compete with the grid prices because of the high labor cost. So that's why we end up with these flat terrain solar things, which are actually, if you look in Germany, uh, in many countries, they're completely irrelevant. Mr. Tahir, you would like to comment on this? Uh, this great in said is one word that we have literally pushed on the brink of extinction. It's not just those solar panels, but so many things like the transmission lines and the land use change, the land use chains in that area that have um, all been there. I mean, I'm not sure if the solar uh, roofing or the solar covering would do much, but it's obviously when, uh, again, that's when, you, when you're supposed to start some some new intervention or say uh, you, are you are to start 
any new intervention in terms of developmental projects or the, the first thing is this what you study is like where to start the thing and that's where we do the environment impact assessment or uh, certain other studies you know before you had started this solar panel thing in that area you were supposed to study what animal or bird or insect or any other species lives there so is if we have already established that then we have really not counted what actually was there that's basically our problem we started a project before our understanding what the animal or what the basic ecology of that place is so again um this has to do something with i might not say but ei impact of uh, ei is the easiness of starting things uh, and then after once we're done we have so many things it's not just the solar uh, thing here uh, we have rail projects we have coal projects and so many vulnerable areas passing through uh, national parks passing through wildlife sanctuaries and even uh, tiger reserves and then we are stuck somewhere where the already the half of the work is done and then we have to take a decision whether this or this so the simple option is keep the basic thing like the basic preliminary investigation thing very clear whether yes or no there's nothing like in the middle you can say okay let's try another alternative let's do something else which is now we are already done with the investment and all so this is the these are the cases that india is really facing with the development uh, things like whether it be railway lines whether it be any other things the the proper in environmental impact assessment of a place is not done when it should be done properly that is the basic thing where the scientists or the students or the researchers need to play an important part once you are done with that then there will be no question of having a, a repercussion or any drawback in that case so i think this would be surely be a badly planning where you didn't investigate early what uh, your uh, installation would do to the, to this bird so very simple thing so that's all i could say but i still think we should actually move away from the big projects towards more decentralized rooftop installations because at the end it's always better to produce the energy where it actually gets consumed no. with less transmission loss and all that see my point is that yeah you must have places i mean if you do a study of an area you know then you look at the places then obviously you might have a place which lies in the middle of a protected area or a forest or a very vulnerable part of the forest land or a habitat of an animal insect bird anything but even then you have a choice either either the place is very close to you or then you know you basically bargain between certain things so here no, uh, so what i'm trying to say is it should not be in an open area at all it should only be on top of people's homes directly on top of the manufacturing industry that is consuming the power we should not be installing the mod right now in india 90% of the installation are happening directly on the soil on the ground right so right if you look at germany uh, 95% of the installation are happening on someone's roof so we I, we are having the the original ratio bond is my right, right. yeah yeah putting 95% of the installations onto somebody's roof because that area is already sealed the Correct. power gets consumed without any transmission loss and Agreed. the only reason why that is happening is because of the way the incentives are happening the like the, the government is facilitating right agreed 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 so i i think we should change that ratio over right yeah, i do agree so um i also agree with tahir's uh, one statement that uh, like uh, uh, like wherever we so where we need more role of uh, scientist and uh, in addition to that administrative level because scientist alone cannot do these kind of things and that administration administrations when they try to do alone these kind of things can happen because then the scientific understanding is totally missing those uh, uh, those things for example like uh, the solar panel on the ground i don't know uh, who can support uh, these kind of ideas i'm i mean with respect to the scientific basis because this is like a total like uh, this is like we are diverting the problem from one place to another because we are not solving the problem because uh, the, our aim is to mitigate the climate the adverse effect of the climate change it is not for creating the problem somewhere else and saying that here uh, something is solved because if you do some deforestation and if you do something kind of solar panel there you are going to get some solution to the energy but what about the uh, the effect of deforestation because that is going to uh, to have our uh, huge sink that is been lost because of the deforestation so 
we are accelerating the climate change. And then in a peanut, we are getting like uh, some additional energy sources. So this is wrong track, track at all. So this is like uh, we are uh, solving one uh, like one minute problem, but then we are, we are having centuries of problem ahead or accelerated problem ahead. So in that sense, I totally agree with Taki's statement that in all the tires of this administrative powers and so on, and, uh, and also the policy making, this kind of evidence-based approach is necessary where the scientists are needed to be included so that the right information can be given. And also as, uh, one more thing that like we, can, we also don't have to be like alarmist in the same that like we have to, for example, like a methane emission, we cannot say that, okay, you, cut, uh, you uh, wipe out our, all our wetland because the methane is being produced. Because what about the ecological aspect? Right, right. Right. So this is more about the holistic view. So this is where we need uh, like um, interdisciplinary people to work around, I mean, the from the science, work around and give the solutions or give the guidance to to the to the uh, the administrations i mean the government so that uh, effective policies can be made so uh, i i agree with what has been said but uh, it's also that i think a related problem is that where these uh, large scale solar farms are coming up or these uh, wind turbine farms are coming up uh, they are considered by many to be wasteland. Right? So that's where uh, Tahir's point where an environmental impact assessment would have made a difference. So solar panels, yes, I mean, it, I, mean I agree with Birbal that if the government can use this as an employment generation scheme, so now they have the rural uh, employment guarantee scheme and so on. So likewise, they can incentivize rooftop installations uh, they can do something similar in the case of uh, windmills in farmlands and so on. I know that there are some schemes, there are some uh, incentives to install these uh, wind turbines and so on. Uh, but in, in, there may be others where you know space is a premium, and there is a tendency to think that because this is eco this is a green initiative then we can use up some wasteland and like desert or, I mean, there have been, uh, there have been some schemes where even people try to put floating solar panels on water bodies, on reservoirs and so on. So the assumption is that this space is lying unutilized, right? So there's, I think here, I think the policy has to be clear, you know, if there's a project coming up, there should be a clear EIA done and these things should be avoided. And as far as possible, avoid such space consuming large projects, I guess. Okay, so the, okay, so we are right on time and I have two more questions to go. To the audience, if you have more questions, uh, you can put it in the chat box and we'll be seeing them later. Uh, they also say that talking about uh, the huge power requirements of our country, uh, which alternative source of energy could possibly replace the traditional methods of power generation in the new future? And yeah, so can we comment on this? I mean, thermal powers, no, not really, but maybe yes. Uh, yeah, go on. So, I mean, most I Right now, the maximum um, power is there in the, or the, the most cost-efficient power would be uh, wind and solar. However, there are some new things coming up that are very significant on the energy saving front. So I don't know if you've heard of anti-solar panels. These are essentially panels which uh, shift, like they take up the radiation on the back Right, and they shift the wavelength so that it radiates to the atmospheric window. So they throw energy back into space. They use space as a heat sink. And these are very efficient to back up cooling systems. So right now, in, there are certain high energy applications. Air conditioning is one of them. Uh, in some places in the northern uh, or in the mountains, it's the heating. So for the uh, cooling, 
this is a very efficient option to reduce the energy consumption in the first place is to use these anti-solar panels. That's a rather new thing. But uh, the thing that is uh, most hopefully going to be the cheapest in the long term is going to be a rooftop solar with battery backup. So essentially panel from the own roof. Birbal, on a related topic, what do you think uh, is the potential for uh, solar powered vehicles? So having enough energy on that vehicle is going to be a problem for us. Where the solar power makes a difference would be for e shafts. So an e shaft costs about uh, one lakh and the solar panel adds another three or four thousand to that bill. It doubles the range and makes the running cost as low as one rupee per kilometer. So in particular, if it's a sort of a card that sells something or if it's a e rickshaw that pays people, uh, that is clearly going to be the future because in the long run, the diesel rickshaw can never compete with that in terms of fuel prices. But for the car, that doesn't make that much of a difference because it messes up the aerodynamics. The rickshaw doesn't go faster than a certain speed. So on a car, unless they get integrated in the body, I don't see how. Um, I think uh, there are also some technical challenges also needs to be solved to make it like a solar panel ready uh, vehicle uh, because uh, the currently the problem is how, how to store um, that energy. So that uh, I mean the batteries. So how to recharge those kind of things. I think they still have to, still there are challenges when it, when it comes into the large scale. I, I mean, yeah, I want to comment because it's such a good discussion. <laughs> but in my place, uh, Kashmir or general Himalayas, you can use them for six months. I mean, once we have winter, so then you look for, you know, you don't have solar, that thing. But we also have one more problem that, you know, in, in the entire Himalayan belt, if you look at the overland spread of the landscape, we see the water, we see the river, we see the potential of a hydropower project. And then we end up what we did in Uttarakhand Chamoli. So that's a problem. And we're doing the same with the Neelam Valley here in Kashmir. That's a big dam coming up and destroying all the things. That's again a problem. So, I mean, I believe that in such situations, we have to think out of the box. We have, I mean, wind is not an option here. We don't have much of that energy here. Solar has its limitations. You have them, uh, you have solar available for six, seven months or even not that much extent. So water you have, but again, the dams create problems. So where, what do you do under such situations? You know, you know, if we need power, that's the thing, you know, we need to build some smart cities. Srinagar is develop, being developed as a smart city. So Srinagar needs to have that 24 hours electricity, which we don't have currently. So, but for that, what do we need to sell out? Do we need to do away with the environment and thing? Do we need to bring in the catastrophic thing or what? Here, we need to think out of the box. Like, you know, let's not go with the conventional solar and need something which has you know multi um, operating things like you know it works on this or it does this it generates this let it be a new invention you know this people can work at it so uh, uh and then this one more thing um, um if we look at the fragility of the ecosystem here not here just the entire himalayas uh power is again a problem so uh um, if we take right from cooking to illuminating things or driving your uh, vehicles or anything, power has been an issue throughout this, at least in this Himalaya, uh, this, the, these three Himalayan states of Himachal, JK and um, Uttarakhand. And it's almost there for almost uh, three, four decades, people have been working up, but nothing uh, has been coming up concrete. No, nobody wants to work on an additional alternative source, I can say, apart from, you know, a solar thing or which works for some time. What we do, we dig, we dig that deep into these mountains, create major uh, dams and all, and then, you know, we invite catastrophes. Here, something needs to be thought of, you know, I as an ordinary uh, researcher or an uh, environmentalist just can think of, no, I don't need to have more of dams. 
yeah i can minimize electricity and all but yes obviously i need to have more electricity where should that come from that's where the science is required so so i can flag one option that exists uh, at a pilot scale not yet there in india but um, the situation in india is ripe for the plucking let's say um, so in germany one of the big challenges of wind was that the uh, farms were getting back down a lot like 30 40% of the time um so that gave incentive to what they call power to hydrogen so essentially if it and the wind plant gets um back down from the grid it starts producing hydrogen uh, recently researchers have found a better way of storing the hydrogen in what they call a power place that can be regenerated so that could be used in fuel cells and uh that would be an option so in that case what one would do is one would produce the power paste at some place where a wind farm keep getting back down because the grid can't take the excess power and would transport it to the site of utilization so right now however the majority of the power uh, to gas projects are either feeding into the gas grid so they are upgrading methane and feeding into the gas grid or they are bottling hydrogen and burning it uh so there are two like 100 megawatts projects that are right now under development uh, or maybe they are already online they were under development when i last checked and these things they have a short development time of like 18 months or so there are two questions in the chat box uh, one rakshit asked uh, why not nuclear for the himalayas maybe and uh, of quick risk and way too costly cost like five times more than solar or wind who wants to pay five times and the uh, health impacts of uh, say the debaji uh, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, elaborate your question uh yeah thank you uh, good evening everyone good afternoon everyone uh, sorry so my question is uh, that uh, due to this climate change and also this uh, air pollution i mean increasing amount of air pollution in uh, india like uh, for the last few decades there are a lot of uh, you know health impacts especially you know respiratory illness cardiovascular disease uh, the number of cases are increasing in different you know uh, uh, in different medical institution and also like uh, hospitals uh, so like my question is what are what are the you know policies that the government implementing to mitigate this or to have some sort of remediation from this aspects you know the governmental approach i really want to know like how they are dealing with these stuffs so two uh, initiatives were uh, big there the first one was the led scheme that has knocked off about um 9 gigawatt of india's peak power demand in the evening hours between 5 pm like or 5 or 6 depends on winter summer and 9 pm and has reduced the lo- load shedding a lot and that uh, consequently has meant that most of the households that earlier used to burn kerosene lights uh are now relying on uh things like mobile torches or uh, uh battery powered lamps or so to get through the short times when the power is not there so kerosene is almost all out almost all over india and that used to be uh one of the lightest sectors which was emitting black carbon which is a uh, light absorbing aerosol particles and that's one of the few things where if you cut the emissions of an aerosol then you get the climate benefits 6 uh, days later because that's the light time uh so that has been very efficient uh, and the kerosene is almost gone now from india and uh, now there is this push to try and push out the chulas in favor of lpg but that's not as successful as the led scheme at this point uh so someone will have to come out with a better way of how to get money into the hands of those who can't afford lpg cylinder refills because 800 rupees is a lot of money to cough up in one go for a daily wage 
and as long as that problem is not solved, the TULAs, which are India's second largest carbon source, are going nowhere. But these are two places where India has done a lot of uh, both healthcare and climate change mitigation, because what you get from black carbon is a smoker's lung. So India was the capital of cancer in non-smoking women because of the TULAs panel. And the case Also, the thing uh, Birbal spoke in the beginning that uh, the reservations on uh, or the subsidies on the coal, if you look at the deaths overall in India, 50% are contributed, 50% deaths by coal uh, pollution caused in India. I mean, uh, that seriously needs to be looked at uh, because apart from those factory laws or whatever, the people who work with these, uh, with coal industry and all, and uh, Apart from that, the people who indirectly are affected by, say, the polluted air, that's a different thing. But yeah, immediately, when you look at the pol direct pollution of the workplaces, 50% of the coal deaths throughout the world are contributed by India. That has to be looked at into, I think. Is it like cheap lab labor that's available for the coal and that health facilities that we're not able to provide to those workers? That would be maybe. I hope that answered you, Devadi. Uh, okay. The voice is not clear. You are muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, the final question is, uh, with the upcoming uh, COP26 uh, event later this year, what are your expectations uh, from the country and the global bodies? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your sentence. The uh, COP26 event later this year. So what are your expectations from there and the global bodies in acting it? Um, I'm really uh, looking forward for the COP26 on a good, a good agreement from uh, different nations of the uh, from the globe, uh, all over the globe, because this is um, um, uh, hugely that says what should uh, what would be our future uh, world in terms of the climate catastrophe, because those are the uh, those are the plans that needs to be implemented, or uh, whether uh, uh, the, the, the countries or the nations will come into some consensus on a different aspect because these are uh, very complex things. Um, so we have been given with uh, this AR6. Now we have, we know to some extent the guidance and how tough and how simple those are and so on. So I I would think that we all will uh, see, will get seriously looked, in, looked by the policy makers and also the administrators and also the, because the science is very clear there. So, and uh, then how to implement that science. Uh, that, needs, uh, that needs extra bodies. It is not, the science is away from the politics, right? Science is uh, uh, more, uh, not more than or not less than uh, the reality. The reality we, we, are, we are showing in, in terms of that as in this report, for example, so now it, it is up to the nations then with respect to all the economic growth and also the sustainable development goals and so on. And uh, then how that can be implemented. And um, I'm really looking forward to that because that saves our uh, future. And then we, there we will see how uh, the skepticism and all these things, what is the role there um, then, you know, in creating this kind of, uh, you know, the solutions-based approach. Others? Uh, okay, so we have a question in the chat box. Uh, Akshay Mohan asked, uh, how effective are uh, nature-based solutions? And many places are promoting ecosystem restoration like uh, carbon sink ecosystems. How effective is it in combating uh, climate change in a country like India? 
it's uh, it oh. Takir, you want to say? Oh, I had something to say to the previous uh, question that yeah. if, uh, can I? Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> so uh, if we are going to the COP26 with a five trillion economy concept and the EIA 2020, then I'm sure, you know, we'll be much worried about the results. Yeah, because you are playing with fire on one end and basically trying it. Uh, trying things at which we, we may be not able to do in, in, in the coming years. We have to 2030 deadline. Uh, if we look at the, the uh, Paris conference, we are still very, uh, we're not doing bad, but look at the over, overall things and uh, look at the uh, Im impacts. Because as I said, the vulnerability of India is very much, you know, we're 12th or 13th vulnerable country. And, and particularly we have such areas like the Himalayan, entire Himalayan event, which is very much vulnerable. And in fact, the coastal areas, much more vulnerable to climate change. So we need to think on that aspects. Can we afford like, you know, dealing away the things till 2030, uh, 2030. So uh, yes, I mean, can, do we need to bring a change in the policy somewhere, keeping the targets in the mind, obviously, but do we need a change in or, or shift in the government policies or, uh, speed up from the lower grounds like the people or do we need a common man say in this thing and how about the uh, institutions like ICER I mean I'm not sure how much is contributed we have so every state has a university every UT has a university how much research does come from that and how much that research goes into the uh, in, in, how, and how much of that research do the persons person take into the the, the COP26 so that's what we need uh, we need a proper scientific backing uh, the results are there because we know we have two things, either we can do or not. We don't have, like, we can be in the middle. Yeah. I mean, scientific things are like that. Either you can do it or you can't do it. But yes, if we have good scientific backing, we can do it. To some extent, we can do it. So I would also like to contribute something to that question. Um, so if I had to sort of put my wish list to the government, what I would really want to see in terms of commitment, one of the first things I would want to see is in terms of commitment is a commitment to phase out two and three wheelers that are non-electric, period, as fast as possible. What that will get us is it will reduce the uh, air pollution from traffic for a lot of uh, harmful um, compounds by 90%, just the two and three wheelers by 90%. So uh, we have a paper under review on that, and um, that is incredibly efficient. And if the uh, if the government supports that, which they don't really, uh, because they don't want to lose the tax that they're getting on the petrol, um, then for the people it's beneficial. And these scooter uh, will go on ten rupees as far as your petrol scooter will go on a hundred. So therefore, it's uh, definitely it's doable from the economic side if the political will work there. Uh, the next thing that I would want to see is uh, the five worst polluting coal power plants shut down because there's so much overcapacity in the sector that India can uh, easily afford to shut down some of the older very polluting plants. Um, and it would even be a probably commercially beneficial to do so. Uh, because then there is the chance that the others don't turn into non-performing assets. And uh, the third thing I would really want to see is um, a commitment to scale the sustainable alternative for transportation to plan to uh, 10 times its current size. So India is trying to uh, produce about a 20 million ton of methane, primarily from waste materials such as crop residue, cow dung, and municipal solid waste by 2025. Uh, what we actually need is over the next decade till 2030, we need to do 10 times as many plants as are being planned under that program. Because right now, every single village in India generates waste that is not getting picked up. And that biodegradable waste and that uh, could straight away together with cow dung go into a biogas plant and produce electricity for that very village. So that's the one scheme that if I could make a wish that India does that, 
uh, then uh, improving the waste management and converting that stuff to biogas. That is uh, something that I would really want to see happening. And every Gaushala should have a biogas plant. It should be mandatory that they have to produce electricity with the powder. That is my, yeah. Dr. Lasha, what are your wishes? Well, I would, uh, to me, the top wish is to see uh, a much faster adoption of electric vehicles. Virbal has already talked about it. I think to me, that would be the single biggest change uh, if the government can do it. But there are issues like taxes and petrol and so on. And it's, uh, I mean, uh, unless there's, uh, it's, it's also a cascading effect. If there are more people buying electric vehicles, uh, then you have more charging stations and so on. And at some point it becomes economically a more attractive option. So at least if the government can uh, do something to push us towards this threshold, to cross this threshold where EVs are cheaper than petrol and diesel vehicles, that would be great. I have one point to add here. So I, uh, I agree with the benefits of the electric car in the, in the Indian uh, market, but how isn't it we are uh, like uh, diverting the energy source it is because from where the electric source will come from we have to generate the electricity so then we have to find the solutions for that that should be environmentally friendly do we have that solution in in our a large scale i think that we need to answer um so that also brings back to me uh, to the, the first point again. So this is where the knowledge gain is or the information gain is much needed because um, uh, as Tahir uh, asked, it is uh, like this, like we can also ask ourselves a question uh, being a scientist or in, in, in top institutions and so on. And whether we have contributed, we have a, a, the contributions that is towards the COP26, whether our, I'm not saying that we have, whether we have a contribution that is a little bit <laughs> wrong sentence, the reiterating that whether our contributions are taking into account when we protect uh, our uh, missions or our uh, commitment towards the COP26, whether this, this have been taken into account, whether we be in collaborative enough to know that this is the, the problem, this is how we are targeting, and this is how we are going to solve. I think the, this question we can also, from, from, the, from this body, the scientific body, I think our uh, audience is also from the science basis. So from the scientific body, we can ask ourselves whether uh, we have done this. And from the students, uh, born, maybe it's small, small things, whether uh, the, I'm, I'm on energy saving mode or not some simple steps and maybe for the science when it comes into the scientific uh, scientist level whether we we have enough contributions to add so these are some kind of uh, self questions so that uh, that also can give some uh, some uh, some solutions or some answers to the national uh, kind of uh, prosperity so i think that um, that also can be taken into account so, but I just wanted to interject, even with the present coal heavy grid, uh, the electric car has a lower carbon emission than the um, normal car, if the size stays the same. Of course, if I buy an SUV instead of a small car, then it, uh, it won't be better to do it But for the two and three wheelers, if we replace all of them, our total electricity demand would go up only by 2% of the nation. So if every single liter of petrol that we burn currently was replaced by, uh, in, in a two or three liter was replaced by the electric counterpart, it's not that much, 2% extra. That's like one big steel plant. 
Yeah, but what about uh, battery batteries, uh, uh, making the batteries and disposing them off after they're done? So after they're done for lithium, we should set up the recycling infrastructure because India doesn't have large lithium resources and old batteries are a source of lithium that cannot be neglected. So uh, that should be solved. I slightly disagree with this uh, because uh, we, um, uh, I understand from the low carbon economic that electric uh, uh, car or electric power as an alternative solu solution can be thought of. But when it comes into a large scale, because when we have to think about the Indian market and also Indian population, even in the European countries, uh, like uh, they cannot replace all the, the cars to the electric car just because it, it, it just exceed the, the so-called the low carbon economy. Because when we shift to uh, all our fossil fuel based cars to the electric cars, then of course we have to generate that much uh, electricity. That is one thing. The second thing is from where we get this, uh, uh, the source of lithium, uh, because we- that's, uh, that's why not cars, two and three wheelers. The difference is the vehicle weight. A two wheeler has a very small battery and it doesn't need a huge range because the people usually take their two wheelers for less than 20 kilometer a day that day. So that is why I said two and three wheelers should be replaced, not cars. We should forget that cars exist. They don't even consume that much petrol. More than 60% of our petrol is consumed by two and three wheelers. Uh, like by two wheelers. Okay, so you mean the public uh, sectors, like- uh, Not the public sector, the private scooties, motorcycles. Oh, sorry, okay, okay. okay. Should be banned okay. for internal combustion engines. No cars, forget the cars because mm -hmm. they're not that significant. Actually, even people who own a car, most middle-class people go to office by school because they can't afford the petrol that it would take to go to office by car. We forgot to answer his question. How effective are nature-based solutions? Many places are promoting ecosystem restorations like the carbon sink ecosystems. How effective is it in combating climate change in the country like India? I'm not sure where the host is, but we would like to carry it forward. <laughs> How don't we? <laughs> yeah, uh, if you would like to please answer the question, our, our host has lost the connection. For, she'll be back in a moment. I'm so sorry. Uh, so we lost some connection. Um, um, uh, Please do continue with your thoughts. Yeah. So if I, uh, if I try to answer to that question, there are some efforts that is being put forward by the country for the natural restor uh, restoration and so on. So, um, but these are not on the scale which we wanted. So there are natural ecosystem that is saving us actually a lot. And so, uh, but uh, from the forestation uh, thing, there are also some of the uh, the lessons also we have to learn because uh, as uh, once in some discussion point we have discussed about the environmental assessment and environmental impact studies and so on it has a, a, a large in, in, uh, importance in when it comes into this uh, forestation i mean the artificial forestation and and then try to get uh, the try to increase the carbon sink uh, so uh, I would say that it is not uh, very easy as it looks like or as it looks like as a solution, but definitely one can think about it and one can uh, study on that aspect, whether those kind of uh, forestation will help us and whether when we make that kind of land use changes, 
what have what happens to the natural habitats and uh, so i think that is more or less uh, needs to be studied before we put uh, our uh, steps on in, onto it so i totally agree i mean one of the things that is uh, fashionable under nature based solutions is that we should try and for sort of force all these savanna and grassland ecosystems but that kind of neglect the amount of carbon that is stored in the soils of those ecosystems, number one and number two. It's sort of, it, uh, it's also fashionable in India because it's that same wasteland concept. So that concept that a space which is not occupied is uh, therefore a waste. Um, but these, these places, they have a value as an ecosystem. And then the other thing is we're emitting so much carbon that you can't possibly sequester it, uh, except maybe into soil. So therefore, I don't think we can do that much with nature-based solutions. Maybe one could convert crop residue to biochar and try to put that into soil. That may work because crops go every year. But essentially, a forest uh, is not something that you can put into any and every ecosystem. Uh, so except maybe along the coast where there is a lot of potential to, uh, to, to let mangroves be restored, also as a cyclone protection. I don't see the, the, the place where one could do that. That's it, maybe. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, compared to other potential solutions, uh, ecosystem restoration, afforestation, I mean, they will have some impact, positive impact on climate change. But if you're thinking of reducing climate change uh, effects, then probably these are not the best solution. There are many other technology-based and other solutions that we've been discussing. Um. Even one of our promises to the Paris Agreement was that we'll increase our area, we'll increase our forest cover by some 5 million hectares. So that still seems a distinct dream because the area availability again matters. And then when we have like the things like Kampa where we go for the forestation, we have a concept of what to plant and what not to plant. In Kampa, what we do, we just take an area, cover it. That's what generally the concept has been planned anything wherever you want. Again, we have issues with that because you cannot plant anything anywhere. I mean, I'll just give a small example that um, I don't know how much amount of Kempa was uh, allotted to the state, 27 states for uh, this. And the interesting thing that the Kempa was given to all the places like yeah, with the, 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 the forestation, the necessary forestation was supposed to be done in you know, wetlands. It was undone to be your forest. It was also done to be your scrubland. And if we say, take an example of Ladakh, what Kampa would do there, what forestation would do, or what would do it, what would it do in a wetland? So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that thing also needs to be taken into consideration that, yeah, although we have promised that that 5 million hectare would be uh, uh, cover like the forest cover would be something like 5 million hectares but would that help until unless we have the sequestration thing or that that thing working uh, because a lot of budget goes into it I mean if this is properly channelized this can definitely help in so, some way uh, getting closer to the target of either the climate change or just changing the cover because uh, one of the climatic things uh, one of the changes uh, one of the impacts of that climate change is the flash floods, I mean, which we are seeing everywhere. And um, again, we have a land degradation which is majorly caused by uh, deforestation. So if the restoration of that uh, areas is taken into consideration first, which has lost its tree cover, so that would be important. I mean, uh, restoration in the sense of uh, replanting the original or the endemic trees in a particular area which have lost them would be very much genuine to do on and would be very much fruitful to start with. And then going on to the newer lands, converting new lands into forest lands, and that won't be that much effective. And also, uh, let's understand that uh, the forest degradation concept because 
if you look at the overall forest scenario of india the uh, the, the the forest situation i mean the, the forest condition is deteriorating because uh, the growing stock we had in uh, we had uh, some years back was around 586.3 million cubic meter which has reduced to 12.26 so in it's a deteriorating health quality of indian forest which we need to understand that the quality of indian forest is deteriorating we have forests but they're not healthy i mean from ecosystem point of view and from holding the uh, from their capacity holding uh, thing and uh, to be a perfect habitat for a particular animal insect bird or whatever and uh, i'm not sure if i uh, put the line very simple like this if uh, you have palms uh, regenerating i mean palms generating or the seeds regenerating in the himalayas uh, what else could be a worst effect of a climate change we have palms which grow in coastal areas or lower area they regenerate and we have seen natural regeneration of palms in kashmir and that's a uh, worst thing and uh, your hair, the bears because i deal with the wildlife so the bears the black bears are not hibernating in winter what they should do normally i mean once you know when we take this thing at what the uh, we we are yet to see this climate effect i'm telling you telling you in himalayas we are already having it I mean before we could realize the impact of climate change we are already having it my dad had no concept of ac i can't live without ac I mean, this is me srinagar i mean now right now so i mean i see i'm sweating right now in the room in srinagar without a fan so that is the situation here so before we could analyze anything it's necessary to understand that the climatic climate change is already happening in vulnerable areas in places like the himalayan entire mindel belt they're already showing their impact every day we have a flash flood though in a smaller area but we do have flash flood we had just the monsoons coming in and we had the cloud burst just couple of days back so they are showing impact that the climate change is already showing its presence in the himalayan or the vulnerable areas so before the people understand when the climate change would be taken con- you know con- into consideration we already have it showing its impact there so i mean we need to start somewhere in the middle because we are already in that platform where the things have already started and we are trying of starting the big, we are try we are starting for a beginning i'm not sure if i made uh, some sense but yeah the point is that in the entire himalayan belt we already facing the climate crisis may it be the regeneration natural regeneration of the exotic plants which is not possible here may it be animals i mean in himalayas or kashmir generally we never had wild boars but we have a good population of wild boars now we had we never had black bears hibern not hibernating during winters but we have conflict and we also have that the snow leopards the the the, the animal landscapes or um, the their territories they're increasing or decreasing the bears are coming down in the human habitations and you see the huge man animal conflict the black bears and the snow leopards are just going up so there's a lot of confusion among the animals itself in fact the trees i mean and now we have new uh, small like micro flora fauna coming in like new birds the birds that were never present i mean the bird number is increasing and people are happy that yeah i saw a new bird it's my first record from the place but i see differently that yeah this is you know a, a kind of a uh, situation where you should understand that it's not a good thing for a place which never had this bird we never had butterfly tiny butterflies we never had insects i mean entomologists are from an insect point of view we never had insects here certain insects which are here which are which belong to the plains or which are basically from the uh, the tropical zones they should not be in the temperate but yes that is how our ecology or the the, the basic the, the, the well knit ecosystem is getting basically getting affected right before the people are starting of thinking in terms of climate crisis so that's my point um tahir thanks it makes totally sense um i think it is uh, so it is in front of uh, you that is happening there so right. no need to say uh, somebody to say that this is happening mm-hmm. so this is like this is all always the true case for the vulnerable uh, regions uh, the, for example when india that for example in arctic regions it's it, it, it's like the glaciers are melting and mm. so that that you can see in the the sea level uh, rise so now what i heard or what i read yesterday that 
This is like a per a decade. This is one centimeter. This is a lot. So th this uh, this last decade, it was the increment was one centimeter. So then, if it goes in that way, so the vulnerable regions, uh, yeah. So you will see the huge impact that uh, uh, the, there itself. So nobody has to convince anyone that it is happening. So yeah, and the speciations and so on. That is. I heard from other uh, people from that Himalayan region, so like, you know, that uh, the, how they experience uh, different, uh, or maybe in their own terms, it is pleasant, but not pleasant for ecologists. So, yeah. So that totally makes sense. <laughs> Um, I was very interested hearing that you said that you're seeing tropical butterflies already in Kashmir because that's one of the sort of uh, things that I uh, make the students in my course do is essentially um, take the climograph of a place and then apply climate change to it and under a certain, from a certain scenario and then they have to uh, sort of try and explain what they think that means, like how will the new climate look like? And students have a very tough time grasping that what this particular Himalayan belt that is actually changing into tropical, and they don't even need the 8.5 for that. Like the, the middle of the road scenario is enough to do that. Um, so it's interesting to hear that that is actually already happening on the ground because they they have a tough time casting what it would be for the flora, for the fauna and all that. I find that very interesting. Um, so yeah. This, yeah, this brings to me one on point which I forgot before. So in this uh, um, in this uh, climate treaties or climate policies, so now it is not uh, not only we have to find out the solutions to cut the emissions or or coming into this 1.5 degree or 2.2 2 degrees Celsius or going into the neutral uh, carbon neutral uh, uh, sorry the zero carbon emissions and it is not only that we also have to work on the adaptations level because it has already happened so this is happening and so we also have to invest some of uh, the things in from the climate adaptation uh, adaptation point of view as well i mean when we when we see about like you know to fight against the climate change so that is also something important for the national level or state level uh, when we uh, are confronted with these kind of commitments that's not uh, a simple uh, problem so uh, going back to the health impacts it is not only the air pollution that everybody knows that it is not only the air pollution so air pollution has a huge impact uh, on the, the different health and so on but for example we have a different frequency of climate extremes like a flood like heat waves and so on. So that will increase the spread of whatever the virus or about the, this another pandemic. So these kinds of situations can come or that will be more frequent uh, when we don't um, you know, uh, make it under control. So these are to think from the health point of view as well, other than the ecology ecosystem point of view. So yeah, so this is like uh, we, uh, we need this kind of uh, like we, we have to understand so this is like happening in multi uh, tiers or multi levels so uh, so that is also like adaptations so this is what I wanted to make that point clear enough we have discussed but uh, just to make it clear very fair point yeah well so I think we are done with the questions and uh, to the audience, I hope your queries have been addressed as well. Thank you so much. And we didn't expect it, but uh, it was a wonderful two-hour session. Now we thought it would be, we would sit for an hour, but uh, this was overwhelming. And okay, yeah, I would say Himalayas isn't sending a happy news at all. So so are the coastal regions as well. But let's hope we see a brighter future ahead. And uh, so. Concluding, thank you everyone.
for being with us uh, and for the entire while with our panelists. And it was our pleasure and our experience to just hear from you about the advancements and the environmental policies of our nation. Uh, we got to know like really new stuff from Dr. Birbal as well. Uh, we have so much to learn, collect data and ensuring the safety of our nation. But it's just, um, in my point, it's overwhelming, you know, when I think of one aspect and then there's another tagging on and then there's another tagging on and it's just like, you know, how are we even going to do this? I mean, if you think of climate change, there's poverty, there's uh, economic growth and then there's health and then there are our, our biodiversity is there. But <laughs> I mean, okay, humans coming together I hope we do something well and, you know, a lot of us in this interdisciplinary thing do step up and, you know, our contributions bring some change. We take it as our responsibility to dedicate a fair share of our efforts to conserve our treasures. I, on behalf of my team, thanks our panelists, Dr. Dhanya, Dr. Lassa, Dr. Birbal and Mr. Tahir for all of your insightful experiences and inputs for us. I thank our audience for your curiosity and questions as well. And thank you all the ISAs for your environment clubs and your efforts in accomplishing this initiative. Thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. And we'll be back again with another discussion on another approach. Till then, stay safe, everyone. And thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for organizing this nice way. This is really all the topics and which we discussed, I, I enjoyed thoroughly. It is a very hot topic, very relevant. And also it is a very timely uh, topic as well. So very, very nicely. We do hope like we make some changes and it shows. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.